Hola a todos. Buenas tardes, buenos días, buenas noches. Bienvenidos. Hello, everybody. This is Abelardo de la Peña, Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to En Casa con La Plaza. These conversations, these are our conversations, presentations, demonstrations, and performances from our home to yours. But in this case, I am at La Plaza. My house is very hot right now, so I needed a little AC and they made this office available for me. So we come to your, our, to your home three, sometimes four or five times per week. It's our way of fulfilling our mission of telling the little known stories of Mexican, Mexican Americans, and all, and all Latinos in the founding growth and evolution of the greater Los Angeles region. If you're joining us, joining us on Zoom, please chat, click on the Q&A and ask those questions. If you scroll on chat right now, you could see that uh, Harry Gamboa Jr., one of our, our panelists, participants, has posted a few uh, of his latest work, so that's great. If you're on Facebook Live, please comment, wave, ask a question. Let us know where you're viewing from. You Zoomers do the same thing, so we, we know where you're, where you're at and who is coming from where. Uh, if you're on Facebook, start a watch party. Uh, again, comments, questions are very welcome. Also, our museum, as well as many other art, history, and cultural institutions have been temporarily closed due to the pandemic. The work continues. I'm not just talking about virtual programs like En Casa Con La Plaza. The curatorial teams at all institutions, most institutions, including La Plaza and our partner organization, the Autry, are continuing their work. And to introduce our presentation today, I'm going to introduce to you Esperanza Sanchez, who will be monitoring, moderating today's program. She's the associate curator at La Plaza. She's held archival, curatorial, and educational positions at the Autry of the American West as well, the Museum of Latin American Art and Cal State University Northridge. She has curated Linda Vallejo Brown Belongings, Ya Basta, the East LA Walkouts and the Power Protests, and Artists Assemble Empowerment and Inspiration in Contemporary Comics. She is working on a La Plaza's new upcoming exhibition, Patriotism in Conflict, Fighting for Country and Comunidad. And with that, I give you Esperanza Sanchez. Take it away, Esperanza. You're muted. Hi, sorry, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm so sorry about that, but I want to introduce you to the other three panelists who are also um, here joining us tonight. I want to introduce you to Tyree Boyd Pates. He is a Los Angeles based museum curator, historian, and public speaker whose museum work centers on the African American experience in the American West. Recently, Tyree joined the Autry Museum of the American West as the associate curator of Western history at the Autry. He is also spearheading the American history exhibitions and historical initiatives that engage communities across the regions for archival purposes, in particular during COVID-19 pandemic and the Black Lives Matters protests uh, that is occurring across the American West. He is also, um, a lot of his museum work has also been received mentioned in the New York Times, the LA Times, Vogue, NPR, Hollywood Reporter, and many others. He's also currently a 2021 Civic Media Fellow with the Annenberg Innovation Lab, Lab at USC and 2020 Innovation Fellow with the UCLA Lunskin Center for History and Policy. We also have Britt Campbell, who is the Manager of Public Engagement at the Autry Museum, a second generation Angelino. Britt locates her practice in LA because of artists in the city using their practice to tell stories about place and identity. She's also a member of the collective Versos and Besos, the anthropology, the anthropony of Manuel Garcia. She produces Southern California's largest Native American Indian marketplace. And she is also the cultural editor at the Encino Enterprise and a staff writer for the Valley Doll Magazine and a former docent at Desert X 2018. Her portfolio highlights include Autry After Hours and Reflections programs that are consistent with the Autry. And lastly, we also have Harry Gamboa Jr., who is an artist, writer, and educator. He is the co-director of the Photo Media Program at California Institute of the Arts. He's also the founder director of Virtual Verti, uh, the international performance troupe. He's a co-founder of ASCO, the Los Angeles-based performing group, 
and his work has been exhibited, collected nationally and internationally, including the Autry Museum of the American West, Museum Ludwig, the Williams College Museum of Art, the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Tate, also the Museum of Palacio de Bellas uh, Artes, Los Angeles County Museum, and the Museum in Paris and in France and other places as well. He's received numerous awards, including the Rockefeller Foundation, the JP Getted Trust Fund for the Visual Arts, National Endowment for the Arts, um, and he's also an author of several books, including Striking Distance, Flower of the Death, The Sixth Expanse, and Urban Exile, and many more. So thank you everyone for joining me tonight. Um, I want to start with Tyree, if that's okay with everyone. We want to talk about some of the things that we are doing here tonight. Um, so Tyree, the first question that I want to say to you is, um, can you please share with us your curatorial work um, and also some of the methods you have used to create a community of exhibition and programming throughout your yeah. work? Yeah, can you guys hear me, see me? It seems kind of pixelated, but I think we're good. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with uh, you all tonight because uh, I think we are in a very unique moment within American history that is finally opening up an opportunity for more voices to be at the Democratic table. Uh, and not only just politically, but also artistically. And through my work at the uh, Archer Museum, um, I've been able to build off of this enthusiasm and just the uniqueness of this time. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of backdrop on some of my work and I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay with everyone. Um, so you guys can see some of what I've done throughout my career. And I'm gonna wide screen it. Da -da 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 -da. Um, view, 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 full screen mode. Okay, can you guys see this stuff? Sure. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of my backstory. So, um, so that's me, uh, uh, a, 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 a little, uh, little balder than normal. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, I've also, um, I've always been having this ontological question of what is the role of the historian and what is the role of a curator? And I've been really inspired by the work of Dr. Lonnie Bunch who says that if you're a historian, then your job better be to help people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember. And throughout my career, um, particularly at the California African American Museum, I've been using exhibitions that discuss the African American experience to open up discussions of what it means to be American, not only in the West, but across the country. And given the proximity that African Americans have to all communities, you can find very intimately the ways in which we uh, identify democracy, identify citizenship, identify uh, civil rights with this community and their uh, pilgrimage to that ideal being fulfilled and also other communities that correspond. So I've done a lot of exhibitions that deal with civil unrest like No Justice, No Peace, LA 1992, Center Stage, African American Women in Silent Race Films. I'm gonna go kind of fast because we only have like five seconds. Uh, and California Bound Slavery and the New Frontier. Fast forward now, I'm at the Entree of the American West and I'm bringing that lens in order to tell more holistic stories about uh, communities of color in the American West, especially those black and brown in Los Angeles. Whew, that was quick. Okay, let me stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tyree, uh, for giving us uh, all of that information here, which is so great. It's a wonderful, a lot of great work that you've done. Um, something that I want to mention um, that I actually want to ask you is how did you and the curatorial team at the Autry develop these collective initiatives focusing on COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, which is something that you're advocating for and asking a lot of our viewers too to donate to the Autry. Yeah, um, so in this moment, uh, the after the Autry closed, the curatorial team was trying to figure out what are we going to do to understand this moment for our future generations. And we saw the proliferation of all of these face masks online that were going viral that um, allowed certain communities to give the world an, an understanding of how they're dealing and navigating this moment. So collaborating with the team, we thought how, how valuable would it be to create a blog post that would um, show the ways in which communities uh, in the American West um, are navigating this historical moment, but also 
we thought to take it a step further and create an entire digital archiving initiative that would lend to a permanent collection that would allow all the communities in the American West in the midst of this pandemic an opportunity to convey the ways in which they culturally identify um, for decades and generations to come. And we uh, know that the last pandemic, um, the, the influenza in, uh, 1918 really told the story through a very white Western lens, but we want to, through our efforts at the Autry, tell a more holistic uh, that centers communities that um, often have been erased and marginalized because of, of historical tellings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Diary, for explaining that to us and sharing that with us as well. And we hope that people would understand what you are doing at the Autry and what other institutions are trying to do as well and would donate a lot of their objects. Yeah. And I want to ask you as a historian and as a curator and a community member as well, mm -hmm. what types of objects are you looking for um, with people from people within our own communities to donate to the Autry? But yeah. also what kind of materials do you typically include in your exhibitions and that you need to tell the story? Because a lot of people might not understand what we are looking for as curators, um, yeah. artists and as public programmers. So if you could share that, please, that would be great. Absolutely. So in this moment, again, uh, we're looking for those who have been um, using home recipes that have been passed down from generation to generation that um, have been employed because of shelter in place and you're passing along to your children. We're also looking for digital submissions of people's uh, face masks, that especially the ones that uh, articulate um, heritage um, we're also looking for um, photography about how you sheltered in place when we were all um, forced uh, to, to be inside more frequently. Um, and now in the middle of the BLM protests, we're asking for people to submit um, artifacts, ephemera, um, clothing, um, submissions uh, to reimagine what solidarity looks like in the civil rights moment. Uh, and I have a few entries of what we've received thus far, if that's okay to share. Excellent. So let me share my screen one more time, guys. Okay. So, so far, we've received um, submissions similar to uh, this uh, Navajo uh, face mask and necklace that is going to go inside of um, the Collecting Community History Initiative in order to articulate the ways in which the indigenous communities in the American West are navigating uh, this very moment. Also, we're going to we're seeking to collect um, children's homework. Uh, this is a piece by uh, a child by the name of Frank Wong, who wrote on March 15, 2020, I did not go anywhere because it rained all day. So we played indoors. Also, we did that because the virus. And this is a really important um, art piece, um, an artifact, because it shows the very innocence of what this pandemic has um, impacted intergenerationally. So this is just that. And then moreover, the Collective Community History Initiative, BLM Protests in the West, we're really um, excited to be getting fantastic images by photographers like Rob Liggins, whose images like this are really um, thought provoking and also soul stirring. And so they, uh, they really give a, a more granular look at what this moment means for the movement for Black Lives. But we, we're interested in all stories, not just stories of those who are on the ground, but those who are in the house, because uh, everyone's stories matter, and we know this to be true. Stop it. Okay. Okay. No, that's great. Well, thank you, Terry. Well, what's one of the ways that people can contribute? Um, since they can't go directly to the Autry and they can't speak to someone over the phone, what's one yeah. of the best methods to reach out to the curators for them to donate these objects? Well, uh, that's a fantastic question because in this moment, we can't walk into the Autry. We can't walk into our favorite galleries and museums. And so the best access point that we have seen really serve the museum is digital conversations. So we have a really robust um, blog uh, vertical online where me and my intern have been discussing some of the things that we have been receiving through submissions, but also it gives you an opportunity to submit via the portal through each and every one of those blog posts. So we encourage you to join us because we want to know how you have navigated this moment, not only just 
for us to say that we have it, but because we want you to be able to walk into the Autry one day and be able to point on the walls, hey, that's my face mask from 2020. And that is a very powerful way of making sure that more stories are told equitably in museum, um, on museum walls. Well, thank you for sharing that, Tyree. And I hope people are comfortable and feel that they can donate their stuff or even provide digital copies of their photographs. You know what I mean? Yeah. That would yeah. be amazing. So I hope that people definitely do that. And I hope that you can also share some of those links as well online so people can uh, see what we are looking for um, and what the Autry is also looking for as well. Um, Another question that I wanted to ask you in connection to focusing on community-based exhibitions, um, well, I wanted to ask, while you were working on these community-based exhibitions, not only at CAM and now at the Autry Museum as well, what inspires you to tell these stories of marginalized people of color? And also, if you can provide a little bit of insight into what external resources you were looking into that were included music, pop culture, whether it was film, documentaries, TV shows, media, yeah. You know, things that just fueled you and gave you energy to create the shows. Yeah. Um, well, I, I will tell you that as a boy, my grandmother uh, used to take me to the California African American Museum. And it was there that I saw myself in a, I saw myself, my community, my heritage elevated. And my job and really my mandate as a historian and as a museum curator is to give all communities that same kind of opportunity to see themselves in a dignified fashion. Because we know that if we're at the helm to tell these Pro, um, these powerful stories, we can be able to rewrite the narratives that have always been traditionally held by others about us. And I'm interested in reclaiming those narratives for not only my community, but the communities that are adjacent. And I know that I can't do that as a, alone. Um, I, I was an activist in my previous life, and, and I know that everything starts at a grassroots level. And so it requires many hands. And so I'm just asking as many people to join me, not only on this project at the Autry's um, through the Community Collecting Community History Initiative, but through all opportunities to community curate exhibitions and public program moving forward. And I've done that through popular culture like hip hop music and cross colors and using films to discuss uh, black women in the early 1900 race films, um, which was a, a seldomly known cinematic genre. And then also just using smartphones and social media really to touch bases because that's the way that we, uh, particularly uh, Gen, the Gen Zers, the Gen Ys, the Gen Xs, the Gen Mes, you know, all of us are, <laughs> are using this, uh, this moment. Uh, to, to articulate our experience. And a lot of people don't know that the ordinary, even though we take it for granted, the ordinary is actually extraordinary. And our gener future generations want to know how we handle this moment. And I want to help as many communities as possible. Exactly. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so Thank much, Tyree. And mm -hmm. you've also, I want to do mention that you have also been curating a toolkit as well, right? <laughs> and you are sharing with everyone. It's on your website. Do you want to talk a little bit about it as well? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I have curated a anti-racist toolkit called Freedom Papers, which allows um, everyone who sees themselves in, as an ally in this movement for Black Lives an opportunity to learn um, extensively through curriculum, uh, speeches, um, articles, free books about what it means to exist as an African person over the course of the, uh, in America over the course of 400 years. So that's available. Um, and I will also drop the link in the chat so people can enjoy that as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sari. Thank you. That's thank you wonderful. So <laughs> and before we wrap up with your session, I wanted to ask you, is there another project that you are working on beyond the COVID-19 and beyond the Black Lives Matter protest uh, with the Entries and the Collection Initiative? Is there another project you're working on that you would love to have also the public and the community to participate as well? Yes, um, I'm currently working on an exhibition that deals with the uh, culinary or the food history of California. And we know that because this is Tongva land, that <laughs> the, the indigenous foods and the indigenous cuisines and all of the communities who um, have been able to commercialize their uh, menus are um, needed to tell a more comprehensive story. And so currently right now on the 
the Octree's Instagram, my colleague Nicole and I are wanting to know what you're eating, not only in this quarantine, but what are some of those things that you feel are noteworthy to share with future generations, because we're curating an exhibition about the culinary history in California, and we need your voice and also your ingredients. So please join us as well. <laughs> Really. Well, thank you, Tyree. Um, thank you. As you know, the Plaza is also working on opening up La Cocina as well. During the pandemic, yeah. we've had a little bit of, of holdbacks, but we have a lot of a community that would be more than happy to share that. So I hope everyone is willing to participate and help Tyree do this as well. Thank um, you. And thank you, Tyree. And we're <laughs> going to move over to uh, Brittany now. So Britt Campbell, um, I wanted to ask you not only um, are you the public program manager, but you're also an art historian as well at the Autry, and you've worked with multiple groups during your tenure. Um, can you please share with us a project that you created that brought a new audience to the museum and was also community oriented? Yeah, so I almost wanted to email to be like, should we say a new audience? And then I was like, no, we should say this in the panel. I think there's a difference between trying to have a dialogue and a co-story, content creation, custodianship, end result uh, agency with our communities. So have I brought something to the Autry that developed a new audience? Yes, but I think in this space, it's cool to be like, let's like not use marketing or grant funding terms, right? Not saying that that work of our colleagues isn't super important, not saying it doesn't fund the cycle of museum institutions, but I think when I try to think about a project that I'm most excited about, it always is Autry After Hours, and why is easily summed up by the other co-panelists here. How would you classify ASCO's work. How would you put in a box Tyree's toolkit, right? There are very intelligent, very creative people continuously radically imagining what the difference is between a record and a story and its relevancy or it's a narrator, it's an aha moment, it's nostalgia, whatever buzzword you want to throw at it, I feel like that is why the Autry After Hours project is something that, again, was kind of inspired by one of my co-panelists. Um, Harry Gamboa Jr. had an exhibition at the Autry in conjunction with the Autry's La Raza exhibition. And it was really in going through that photographic series of Harry's in conjunction with the photographic contributions of the staff and photographers of La Raza, where a moment in history isn't flat right? Love me some museums, choose to base my practice in them. But um, I actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to pull out a note card so I don't like, his name is Malcolm. I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I'm the worst sayer of things. But he identifies identifiable aspects of culture. And those include language, ceremony, traditional arts, skills, and beliefs. But there's this fleeting thing about culture, right? And that's ambiance. So what kind of programs am I excited about? I think a result of programs I'm excited about lead to a new audience. But I think the exciting part is actually being able to have museums communicate this fleeting aspect of culture, what I or Malcolm are calling ambiance, in a way that again, as Tyree was saying, feels more equitable. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Brittany, for sharing that. That's wonderful. Um, and it's good that you're talking about this because I wanted to ask, like, what type of stories are you interested in exploring as the Autry continues to expand their collection? You have a new audience. And again, you're trying to make it more equitable for everyone and especially for people of color and especially indigenous community as well. That's something that the Autry has been focusing on. So if you could share a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, so uh, again, love me some museums, but a problem is space right? I don't think people understand the breadth or depth of the Autry collection because we're always limited, especially in a city like Los Angeles, by square footage of display space. So I would say if you would ask me this question pre-COVID, I would say I'm excited to tell contemporary stories um, because in the shelter-in-place ordinance, we haven't really had 
access to the type of liminal experiences or in-person collaborations that I'm used to basing my practice in, what I've actually like really gotten into is archival storytelling. Um, I think it comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of personal narrative, but it also comes from a deep root with your community, however you define that. And so um, I think right now, Manuela Garcia, which is the collective that I'm a part of, those are the stories I'm interested in telling. I'm interested in like Tyree and Harry, I think realizing what the records of the past in dialogue with contemporary viewpoints can really tell the long history of Los Angeles because I have pride for my city and I hate that we're classified as a city that rewrites its history or a city that rebuilds on itself or just a facade. Uh, and so I think if we do a better job at really looking into the collections of our museum institutions, we can tell the stories of culture bearers of the past by a contemporary interpretation because the archives of the past don't leave a perfect record by any means. And I think we can just all contribute to leaving a better record for the custodians that will inherit the work that we're doing in the future. Well, thank you, Brittany, that's great. It's wonderful that you're thinking in that way. And we've had multiple conversations, as you know me, I'm yes. big Angelino. <laughs> I asked of course. Yeah. <laughs> And I wanted to ask, you know, um, as someone who's also community, com connected to making these community-based programs, what inspires you to make them so accessible to everyone, whether it's at the Autry, whether it's online or, or through workshops, what is it that inspires you? So I love that Tyree started talking about his grandma because I'm going to talk about my grandma. Like, I think grandmas maybe are like the single most point of inspiration, or if it's not your grandma, you probably know some intergeneration that has taught you your story. Um, so I'm from a family of artists and we oscillated between LACMA and the La Brea Tar Pits because my brother and I can decide on two things like dinosaurs and outdoor public art. Uh, so that's what we went to as kids. And my grandma was both a fine art painter and a needlepoint artist. And so I didn't have this proliferation of your medium decides if it's highbrow, if we would classify it as art or an object. Um, and so I think it was this dissonance that I felt about the traditions that were passed down to me by my grandma and then how they were displayed in the museums that my grandma took me to as a child very frequently. And so I began this dialogue probably at like six or seven with like, well, grandma, why if you restored a chair? would it be in like the folk and craft museum? But like, if you got famous enough for a painting, it would be in LACMA. But like, if we found a bone, it would be in the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, so it's like a weird understanding at a kid that makes you wanna ask these questions in the field. Oh, and that's great. Thank you so much, Brittany. And my very last question, you know, before we wrap up your uh, section of this, this panel as well, I wanted to ask, are there any upcoming projects that you are focusing on that would allow not only Autry visitors, but everyone in Los Angeles, and maybe throughout the world as well, to participate and share their perspectives? Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna run, not through these lightning fast, but I, like Tyree, feel like his PowerPoint where he had to click, click, click. So I'm gonna go in order of when I know they're happening. So September to October, look up Dryland Literature. It's a literary journal based out of South Central Los Angeles. They are amazing. They just produced their issue 10. They will have digital engagements that will either play out as a hybrid experience in real life or online. We're looking at COVID safety standards and a bunch of other boring stuff I'm not gonna take up your time with, but that'll play out September to October. In October, we get to host at the Autry as a digital series, a archival storytelling workshop um, with a woman named Raina uh, Leone, who is just fantastic. And then the one that I'm also the most excited about, but also the most uh, unconfirmed about is the collective versus Ibezos, the anthropony of Manuela Garcia. Anthropony means like the cacophony of sounds that are created by humans. Um, it started with an archival wax cylinder of Manuela Garcia in the Autry's collection. And uh, I have just taken an Occidental intern 
which is another connection to Harry Gamboa because they focus on In Plain Sight, which is a collective of over 80 artists um, uh, who are working in Los Angeles. You might have seen their sky riding over 4th of July. Harry's contribution was over Bakersfield. Uh, but I'm getting an intern and the hope is that we can somehow have a combination of the archival work by Manuela, the contemporary perspective of the collective with her work and some visual or performance or social contributions by In Plain Sight play out as an augmented reality experience across Los Angeles. You know, I'm gonna uh, hope it plays out and also assign a lot of the research and work to someone else. So uh, it'll be great. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brittany, for sharing that. And I hope that you can also drop that link on our uh, chat as well so people can see what they can contribute to just the way that they can contribute to Tyree's projects as well. So thank you. Um, and I want to move forward with Harry now. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I wanted to ask you for your segment as an artist and an activist. You've been part of the walkouts, the Chicano movement, a long career in art as well and um, in education as well. Will you please tell us a little bit about the current project that you have been doing with COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter and how it became and how, well, not only how it became, but how the fruition came with the Autry as well. Well, um, maybe I'll start with the um, work I did with the Autry. Uh, I was uh, approached by um, the Autry to see if I might uh, take a look and see, and see what's going on in Los Angeles while everyone was required to stay indoors, uh, which meant I had to violate the code and um, hit the streets. Um, I basically have, um, um, I was born in Los Angeles, actually uh, overlooking the Hollywood freeway. So I'm absolutely um, kind of imbued with the entire urban feel as it were. And uh, uh, even growing up, I wound up uh, spending much of my childhood in what no longer actually exists, which was Bunker Hill and Boyle Heights and uh, um, have spent quite a bit of time walking throughout the city of Los Angeles. I teach a course in CalArts where we walk. It's called um, LA Urbanscape and so I'm always uh, about and uh, and I found that uh, uh, the invitation by uh, Dr. Amy Scott to participate in this project uh, uh, would be challenging to go out and see if somehow it would match what I might have imagined. And um, uh, I, I tend to um, also view Los Angeles as uh, 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 not only an urban scape, but uh, sort of a film set to a great degree. And uh, much of the actual existing landscape in Los Angeles, of course, is uh, absolutely completely artificial. Uh, most of the plants and creatures that populate Los Angeles are either invasive or have been planted there, um, as are the people. And so uh, so you have this very, very strange kind of environment where everyone's milling about and uh, and maybe there, there are a handful of people who kind of have a sort of a longer uh, background with the place, but um, absolutely everyone's invited to come out and play. But when everyone's disinvited to come out and play, all of a sudden everyone is uh, having to share maybe an experience and maybe only a few groups have experience and uh, for instance I come from the I'm a Chicano and um, and in Los Angeles in the 20th century there were many times when Chicanos were disinvited to go outside and uh, and very um, uh, daring to to be outside and and to be identified and so in a very big way uh, uh, made invisible um, in quite often in the local the statewide and particularly the national as well as the international conversation. And so uh, maybe early on my, my idea and my hope, um, uh, as you mentioned from the East LA walkouts, um, I, was, I became active at about the age 14 um, and have been kind of someone who's always uh, um, in some way or another has been documented, um, uh, but really in a way uh, responding to things that had happened when I was, was even much younger when Los Angeles um, really reflected some of the tone and the signage and the behavior of what one might have found in um, apartheid South Africa. Uh, this would have been post-war, post-World War II. 
Uh, the other thing, of course, it's not often mentioned about Los Angeles was um, particularly, uh, I was born in 1951. Uh, I've been on many different kinds of special committees, but um, uh, people born in 1951, uh, we absorbed all the nuclear uh, material from all the various nuclear tests in Nevada. So uh, there were nearly 1,200 nuclear bombs that were exploded during my childhood during my teen years. And so, um, you know, you often hear about the smog and it was irradiated smog. And uh, in, in a way, it was um, a way of filtering out people that would not survive. Uh, many kinds of things actually uh, caused people to vanish, uh, including the Vietnam War and other kinds of things. And of course, we're here currently with the Black Lives Matter, which is very vividly expressed through the murder of African Americans, but of course, uh, uh, this is highlighted here, and, uh, uh, but of course it's happened to all the groups of people, but uh, more specifically targeted, uh, of course, uh, Black Lives, but in Los Angeles, it's something that's normally underreported, and, um, and I have experienced many moments where things occurred that were underreported, which actually spurred me on to become a photographer. And, uh, and, and uh, because of the way I grew up uh, uh, in a very Mexicanized, and uh, which is very difficult to kind of express some of the ideas, but maybe one of the important ideas that I might want to share is something uh, that comes from the Aztecs, uh, which is known as Nepantla, which uh, means to be in between. And that is sort of a concept of being both alive and dead. And uh, which of course we celebrate in Dia de los Muertos and and I was born on Dia de los Muertos de los Niños, so, which means I, was, I broke the first law, I lived. And so uh, I celebrated uh, 365 days a, a, a year. Um, but it's that idea that uh, uh, it's uh, rather cosmic simply to experience uh, the daily life. And I found that um, uh, Los Angeles is probably very horrific and at the same time quite beautiful uh, in that it's kind of... Uh, shares the entire spectrum of what possibly the human experience can be like. Particularly now, we have so many people from all around the world and, and I'm so fortunate as a faculty member, I've taught at Cal Arts for 15 years and I've taught at Cal State Northridge for 25. I've been uh, taught many, many universities, um, uh, but have, an ex have, to, uh, have the opportunity to meet so many young people that come from such diverse backgrounds. And, and I'd have to say at some of the institutes I have a uh, possibility of meeting some of the brightest and most talented and most motivated people. Uh, I've also taught at all five Southern UC schools. And so uh, many of the people that I meet, I am kind of see as being, uh, you know, uh, you could tell that their influence is, uh, is going to be very powerful. And, uh, and I have a tendency to look at everyone somewhat through a cinematic eye in a way, and, and everything seems to uh, appear to me almost as a movie or as a, as a story. And, um, and so I tend to put things, even though they might be documented, they tend to create a narrative. Um, uh, the Chicano Male Unbonded work that you mentioned, Britt, uh, uh, they showed 100 and uh, I believe it was uh, uh, 80 photographs that were shown at the Autry, but there's closer to 200. Um, and, uh, and I've documented the men who I know uh, one way or the other. One, of course, is Abelardo, uh, the La Pena photograph from long ago. And, uh, uh, but uh, 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 there's been many kinds of um, things that I do. And so when I went out into the streets for the Autry, it immediately struck me as being very uh, a sign of dystopia, um, very similar to some of the um, legendary Hollywood films that were actually shot in Los Angeles. But at the same time, these hopeful uh, moments and also moments of fashion. Uh, people who are attempting to strike out uh, and uh, grab attention and at the same time uh, this idea of uh, observing and making an impact on society and and, uh, and and when I went out it was very early in March uh, to photograph so it was very the uh, very sparse population and um, and so you could hear things that you normally wouldn't hear uh, because of the car sound being down and, and the, it seem, seemed also that the air pressure was very strange and the air quality, of course, Los Angeles has the bluest skies and yet at the same time, the worst air pollution. And, and all of this has to do with artificiality. 
uh, everything's induced, the blueness is induced, the sharpness is induced, the memory is induced, uh, and also the loss of memory, the forgetfulness is induced. And so, um, and so I tried to capture what I actually saw. And, and for me, one of the things that uh, seemed to be staring were the uh, people who were still working. So uh, construction workers, postal workers, people who I would counter on the streets. I didn't encounter any medical workers. They're, of course, they were doing work interior and I did everything exterior. Um, found a few people still willing to use public uh, uh, transportation and bicycles and walking. And then, of course, the people who have no place to go, the homeless, and, um, and others who simply wanted to promenade themselves and look cool and to dare uh, to be out there and people jogging actually. And in this also um, the sense of purpose and the sense of privilege and the, self, the sense of self-love and even uh, some symptoms of self-hatred. And so sure. all, all of this that seemed to emerge um, seemed to populate the people that I photographed. I could show you one or two pictures if you would. Yes, that would be great. If you could share that, we have about two more minutes. If you if can I do can that, please. Uh, let me see, here we go. I think so, we're right here maybe. Yeah, so these are the images that were sh uh, created for the Autry. Um, these were part of the, actually the original works were, uh, these first few works were actually uh, acquired by the Autry. And um, uh, first one was, um, first one was the workers. Um, much construction taking place throughout the city on the subways, uh, buildings, everything's going up, everything's being fixed. Um, these two young people were kind of having a good time, but uh, protecting themselves. Uh, this is in Boyle Heights. Uh, um, this is one of my performers, very well-known uh, artists, uh, Francesco Cicados, a uh, printer, um, a young artist, uh, Ruth Murillo, performing. Um, this one, um, Reminded me of the 1950s, kind of the, the nuclear family going for a walk under harsh conditions. And I felt that it was kind of interesting that the, even the crossing the sign was uh, masked. Um, many of these other, other images are shared by the Autry. Um, the idea of, um, of people behaving in compulsory fashion. Um, I guess this kind of showed the expanse of the um, uh, socioeconomic spectrum, actually. Uh, people just walking aimlessly, maybe, and people performing in the streets, having fun. So and were these people performing on their own um, are, when you were walking by? People, these, these are people that uh, some were former members of OSCO, and some were former members of, of uh, Virtual Verite, and some are part of the troupe that I'm working with now. It's, international troop of about 200 people. And, uh, and just people standing in line, uh, orderly, uh, daring, fearful, and yet hopeful they can get something to eat. So, um, and of course, uh, um, this is Sine Woods, a famous artist. She had just finished teaching at Harvard. Um, she had been a colleague of mine at CalArts. Um, and I do have a question, Harry. Um, since you were going out there and you've done this for a very long time, you've been an activist, an educator, and um, an artist as well. You know, one of the questions that I definitely have, and I'm sure our viewers have as well, is that you ever felt in danger or, you know, or felt like your health was also in danger while you were taking these photographs while everyone else was at home? Well, you know, I, I grew up in East LA in a very harsh environment, and um, I've actually written about how I stood on a street corner once when 25 police officers opened fire with live ammunition into a peaceful protesting crowd. And I have to say that's almost close to being the most danger I've been in in my life. There's been a few other times uh, where people were a little bit closer, but uh, this idea of being under um, these kind of conditions really remind me of the 1950s uh, when it was, uh, poisonous to go outside. There was a moment in 1980s also, I'm not sure if you know this, but um, in very uh, impoverished neighborhoods in Los Angeles, uh, the military on behalf of the order of the, of the governor at the time sprayed all of our neighborhoods with uh, malathion, uh, 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 something that was considered to kill uh, uh, mosquitoes, but is actually uh, neural poisoning 
uh, something that's illegal in warfare. And so um, there's been many times when uh, I have been exposed to many uh, things. And uh, so I'm not sure. I believe I'm probably so polluted. I make a probably very poor host. So um, I'm probably safer than most. So um, maybe that's it. Oh, and here we'll have one more person who's a little bit uh, not ex a little bit more prepared. And this is actually Duke Choi, a former student of mine, um, received his uh, PhD somewhere in Switzerland, but uh, brilliant guy, but out collecting uh, samples uh, that day. So yeah, maybe we'll just go with that, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Harry, for sharing this. Um, I wanted to also ask, just to wrap up your, your segment as well, is um, you obviously, a lot of this work was commissioned by the Autry and it's on their website, um, which is wonderful. And you also have a collection with them as well from, um, um, from 2017, I believe. Yes. Um, so my question is, is you're still taking photographs and recording, star, or, or recording stories beyond the Autry, correct? Right, yeah. So I recently did a project for something called uh, Striking Distance, which is a book that's available on, on Amazon. And um, there I, I photographed 19 people who posed for me. I also have images of that. I don't know if you want to see any of those, but um, I know we're kind of running out of time. But uh, um, for that, I, I invited actually 30 people of which 19 showed up. And uh, just the re requirement was that they show up wearing a mask. Um, these are all people who I know um, closely, uh, either former students or performers or people who I've worked with. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, um, and, uh, and maybe I will show, I, I've been asked to maybe show one or two, if you don't mind. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to go one more time. Let me give us a try. Uh, we'll try one more time. So yeah, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, can you see my image? Yes, okay. So um, this is Sunay Woods. This is Ben Quinones, um, Francesco, Calvin, Jasmine, Maria, Henry. All these people are posing. Um, the people who showed up are kind of representative in a way of a uh, number of group of people. Everyone here is pretty creative, somewhat scientific, socially engaged, politically engaged, economically engaged. Um, these are all the people that might survive a nuclear blast. Uh, these are all the people that will make things. These are all the people that can carry on a great conversation. These are the people that teach as they move along through life and absorb and share and actually shine and, uh, and are quite fashionable also in their own manner. And so in this, I wanted to have people that were striking, um, but I had to get up close to them. So it's uh, close enough to, to get something, close enough to get hit, close enough to hit them, close enough to take a good look, close enough for them to grab my camera, close enough to share an, a, a, an intimate moment, um, close enough for me to know who they might be, uh, and at the same time uh, for them to be able to identify me. And so... Um, I found that uh, this experience, which really was taken in a period of two days, um, could make sort of a document, a book, which I created as a book, um, and specifically in July. And July was a very uh, intense month with so many things happening, um, uh, situating out of the United States, taking place in Los Angeles, uh, taking, expand, uh, taking place throughout the world. I was actually supposed to be all throughout Europe in July and all through Mexico. And of course, I wasn't able to go. And so I felt that to create something in July, and it was also when I participated in an in plain sight uh, and managed to drive all the way to Bakersfield. And, and, um, and, and it just seemed like very intense moment. And one of a particular moment in time and a memory uh, that could be shared. And so, um, uh, and uh, and so I, I felt that uh, it would be sort of just a, a, a nice curated grouping of people and as a, as a series of portraits uh, would kind of capture the moment um, of being a member of the 21st century, uh, being part of the global uh, 21st century. And at the same time, I feel showing the value of the presence of people and the beauty of people and the way we have to respect people 
and actually respect everyone's uh, uh, space and their position and, uh, and allow everyone to have, and I think one of the things that I'm, I'm most interested in is making sure that everyone is having fun and having a very strong um, uh, uh, assertive stance. Um, we all need to be able to stand because we all belong here. Uh, everyone who's here belongs here. Wherever you are, you belong there. And so anyone to tell you that you are not belong and that you cannot belong and that you don't belong, uh, they're completely wrong. And we are, we are all members of the same uh, species. Um, we have different histories, but in the end, we are all human beings and, um, and we share the same planet. And it's extremely important for us to show uh, mutual respect and to understand that we all have differences, but that our differences um, might seem strange to one another, but if you take a closer look, it's more than likely that it's absolutely quite uh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Harry. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you were able to share not only those images, but also the background behind it and your insight into what you were doing while you were doing these projects and how you continue to do this, even beyond the entry and even beyond the commission works that you are provided and everything. So thank you so much. And if you like, please feel free to drop the links on the books that you have published and any other programs, I mean, excuse me, projects that you have. Um, working as well because I know a lot of people are very much interested and we've used to work at the at the museum as well and so has the Autry and we will continue to reach out to you um, especially the Autry and of course La Plaza because you are very instrumental into telling this history as well um, so thank you so much for doing that and um, I hope that everyone is very happy with the work that you are doing and, and so is the Autry as well as we are um, and now we're I would like sure. to just mention that everyone should really take a look at the Sunday print edition of the LA Times. It's about uh, featuring the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Definitely, thank you. Yes, definitely. Well, then I'm now going to pass it over to Tyree. We're going to move over to the next segment. Thank you so sure, much, Harry. Sure, sure. Well, um, thank you, Harry. And uh, it's a great opportunity to share more about what's happening um, with Esperanza at La Plaza <laughs> um, and her great curatorial work across the city of Los Angeles. So my first question to you, Esperanza, is uh, please share your curatorial work and method with developing a community-based exhibition. I know you've done several. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, so I started very early on. Um, at first, I thought I was going to be an educator. I really thought I was going to be a history professor or a teacher. And somehow I got introduced into California State University of Northridge. They have their own you know, special collections there. And, um, the librarian there was also the curator. So she kind of introduced me into exhibitions. And so she was very geared towards the collection, but also the community within Northridge. And um, from that place, I was able to move over to the Autry where I was a museum educator and I was able to work with the curators there. And there were two curators that I remember very well, um, Cage and Jeffrey, who were very involved with working with different community members um, at the Autry and also working with education. And so they kind of introduced me into the idea of bringing in the community and how do you work with them beyond just the collections and um, bringing in advisors, bringing people of color as well into um, the institution. And so from that, I was able to work at the Museum of Latin American Art, where I was even introduced into a farther larger community there and how to bring in the arts and not only history, but culture as well. And this one was far more beyond and expanded, which was Latin America. Um, so it wasn't just based in Los Angeles or Long Beach. And then how do you bring um, education initiatives into it as well and working with live artists, so not just your own collection. And then of course, La Plaza, which is a very different institution, but also a museum as well. As we know, the museum um, that I work at currently at La Plaza does not have a collecting um, collection but we do borrow a lot of objects from different community members. We work with archivists, artists, we've worked with Harry before. We've also worked with historians and a lot of members within the community who are bringing in their stories who probably haven't even donated their objects or their photographs or any of their letters, any materials to institutions yet because they're still holding on to them because they're very Mm -hmm. um, preserve, but also because they want to preserve their, their collection as well. So we base it a lot on oral histories and, and having these advisory meetings, but also even building um, um, community engagements with 
um, Ola. We've also worked with um, the California African American Museum. Um, and we worked with the Smithsonian as well to kind of bring in these stories. And one of the ways that we're able to bring in these collections is we know that a lot of people, you know, do not feel comfortable providing their stuff, you know, because it, they hold on to it because it's very dear to them. One of the ways that we convince them is by having these community collections in a way of saying, this is an outreach. You're just lending it to us for about nine to 12 months. That's it, we'll bring it back to you. We're gonna make sure to tell your story. We definitely record everything that they're saying, all the measurements, of course, but it's a way of connecting with the community so they can reflect on themselves, just as you mentioned, Terry, right? And so that's yeah. one of the ways that we are doing that. And that's actually one of the projects that I'm working on um, next, which is a uh, patriotism and conflict, uh, fighting for community and comunidad. So we're bringing in the perspectives of not only the Chicano moratorium and the activists that were involved with it in the protest, but also the veterans that were in these wars whose mindsets might have changed or maybe still held on to the beliefs that they were holding on to, um, to bring in those stories. And a lot of them, you know, do not feel comfortable donating it yet. But mm -hmm. at a certain point, if they decide to, they can. But if not, they're only lending to us for a, quote, a few months. And then we're returning back to them, museum quality, taking care of and everything else. So that's something that's very instrumental for us, especially because we have so many people in LA coming in to so many different museums. And it's our way of connecting with them and making sure that their stories are being told. So that's one of the ways. That, that's that's a, a wonderful uh, approach to making this community curation possible. Um, and especially considering that uh, uh, um, oftentimes some of these institutions are non-collecting and you're still being flexible and integral uh, to make sure that you're accountable to those communities. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you that like while working on these community-based exhibitions, what inspires you to tell the stories of marginalized people of color? And can you provide insight into what external resources, such as music or pop culture, film, documentaries, TV shows, et cetera, um, assist you in fueling your energy to create such a show? Sure, definitely. Well, I definitely wanna give credit to the previous people that were here before me. Uh, definitely to my previous uh, senior curator and mentor, uh, Aaron Curtis, and also Mariah Berlangshev-Chak. I think they were very instrumental in kind of gearing me towards that because I come from a very academic background of like, I can do any research, I can watch any documentaries, any TV shows, listen to any music. Um, and even Abelardo has given me a couple pointers as well as what type of music I should be listening to as I'm doing these exhibitions. Um, and, and also Brittany as well. And one of the things that I definitely want to mention about them is they were very instrumental at making those connections with people from the very beginning. And they geared me towards that as well. So it was definitely talking to advisors. Anytime we had a big public program, they definitely advocated that we be present and talking to people. So that way they became much more comfortable with coming in and dropping, not dropping, but dropping their uh, stories and being more comfortable to share their objects with us. So that's definitely something that I learned from them very quickly. But also, um, I, again, because I'm such a historian at heart, anytime I'm listening to certain music, whether it's the era, I also definitely listen to Hamilton, uh, the <laughs> soundtrack. I know that sounds so <laughs> cliche, but for me, I just felt like I need to understand how this nation was created. And of course, that's a different perspective, but <laughs> it's also understanding how someone, which is Linda Moran, who is also a person of color, is yeah. also gearing that history to make it personable for people to understand what's going on. So mm -hmm. for me, if I'm listening to my shot, I'm thinking as a curator, if you have activists who are out there protesting, probably in their mindset, they're not thinking I'm you know, gonna give up my shot, but they're not, um, they're really thinking about how are you gonna progress this? How are you gonna right. motivate people? And so that motivates me um, and then, of course, I have a, a simple playlist, which is just motivation and energy. But definitely, uh, Hamilton is always on there. And it's been on the last two exhibitions that I've done. So that's always the funny part. But yeah. That's, that's terrific. Um, and you answered, in some total, all of the questions. So slam dunk through and through. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're right on time at 7.58. So it's a great segue to our good, our good moderator <laughs> to lead us into the horizon. Definitely. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much uh, to to our presenters and contributors. Uh, Esperanza, of course, moderating Brit and Tyree and Harry. We have a couple questions here I want to throw out. This one is for the Autry from an anonymous attendee on Zoom. <laughs> uh, what kind of structures needed to be in place 
with the community for a rapid response exhibition, community collection efforts to be executed thoughtfully and mindfully? Um, it requires, I'll take that one. It requires active listening, not from the community's perspective, but from the institution. It's of the utmost importance that the institution reflect the needs, the desires, and the experiences of the communities so that they can properly um, archive and ultimately give an account to convey the authenticity of that experience. And the, given COVID-19, social distancing, and the inability for us to physically come together, um, institutions have to be more flexible than ever to listen and also to take cues about how to curate certain communities' experiences within them at the table. All right, uh, for uh, a question for Esperanza, how does La Plaza reach out to the community to submit donations or contributions to certain exhibits? Definitely. So one of the big ways that we do, we definitely use social media. We also use our newsletter, but we also develop uh, flyers. Of course, with COVID-19, we're not able to do that. As I mentioned before, we used to go to public programs or if there were special events that were going on at La Plaza, we would kind of reach out to people who we knew were coming in. Uh, but now because of COVID-19, obviously our newsletter, social media, and we have a Google form currently uh, for patriotism in conflict, for fighting for fighting for country and comunidad. So if you are interested, we can attach the Google form here so you can not only take screenshots, but you can give us some a little bit of background and measurements so we can think about if we can put these objects in the exhibition. And, and if it doesn't work for this exhibition, we are also open to having it for our permanent exhibitions because that's something that we also depend on because we don't have a permanent collection. So we're always open to anyone who's interested in um, you know, providing temporary loans for us at the, at the museum. All right, thank you. Uh, and for the Zoom uh, attendees, we will send you an email with a link to that form. And for our Facebook viewers, we'll also include in the comments section, not right now, but we will uh, be including that uh, link as well. Uh, one last question for both uh, uh, institutions. What's your strategy to reach out to Angelinos, build that trust and encourage them to donate all while they're facing this crisis? Um, outside of listening, um, it is providing a level of transparency so that they can see the process as opposed to going underground and then <laughs> bringing, bringing up a finished product that we have um, to kind of um, force feed <laughs> the content, which is never the best, which is never the best methodology. But I think now, um, um, the, the Autry and its leadership has a direct investment in broadening out the curatorial voice as well as the offerings for future uh, years and seasons. I think now is a ripe opportunity to, to re-engage, reacquaint ourselves with the communities that have an investment in us and in, us and them. Mm -hmm, definitely. And um, with La Plaza, the same thing, you know, our method too is um, not only with community building, but also building that trust. We definitely allow people to fill out their information. We call them um, a few times to build that relationship with them, but also our new senior curator as well, um, Karen Cruz, who is coming in, who's also um, very experienced at this, has also thought about different ways that the museum can move beyond the exhibition walls and working with our education department, our communications and special events. So it's very oriented to how many other people can expand beyond curatorial as well as Terry mentioned. So it's just building that trust and, and, and being honest as, as Terry was saying and, and allowing people to feel comfortable on their own terms you know, to see. And if it doesn't come out the first time around with the first exhibit, maybe around the second time they'll come around you know, to donate or, or to lend to us. Okay, well, thank you so much. I uh, want to give a shout out to some of the, the people out there. Frankie Firme, uh, listening, but also watching the DNC live tambien. <laughs> We're going to have to watch it, uh, us on the presentation, uh, watch the highlights later on tonight. Armando yeah. Rodriguez, Pasadena House. Samantha, Samantha Avitia viewing from Boyle Heights and Alonso Cedillo, hello from Mexico City. Uh, Gabby Valle, uh, she says she heard Tyree talking about this project, your project on the local news. And nice. <laughs> Rock Lopez, Sonoma stayed in the house. So uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, uh, of course, the, the four of you, uh, all the attendees out there on Zoom, on Facebook. If you did not catch this entire session, you could catch up with this one 
plus the 50 others that we've done since April at our website, laplazala.org, uh, on our Facebook page at La Plaza, and also our YouTube page at La Plaza LA. Uh, one of the sessions you could catch is Esperanza on uh, talking about our current exhibition that's on our walls, uh, that's still waiting for people to come in and see, hopefully someday soon, is the Afro Latinidad Mi Casa, My City, which was a community contributed exhibition. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If you're enjoying our In Casa sessions, please join us as a member of La Plaza. Our members make these programs possible. I'll include the link on the chat and on our Facebook page. Thank you to our sponsors, SoCal Gas and the California, uh, let's see, and the California Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Securities Care Act of 2020. Uh, again, catch these sessions later. You could see our upcoming sessions on our website, lapca.org, and on our Facebook page. Coming up this Friday, Dan Guerrero is twice monthly happy hours with guest Alberto B. Mendoza from uh, the director of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, which is this Friday at 7 p.m. On Mondays, we turn it over to our cocina. Esperanza uh, spoke briefly about La Plaza Cocina, which is our uh, in construction museum and kitchen, uh, teaching kitchen, which is gonna be right across the street from La Plaza. But we do cooking demonstrations every Monday at three o'clock coming up on Monday, the 24th is shrimp and avocado salad and a cocktail from mm -hmm. Lucy Thompson Ramirez of Pez Cantina. And you could catch all of our in Casa con la Plaza Cocina sessions on our Facebook, YouTube, and website as well. And the list goes on, but that's it for tonight. Any last words from anybody? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. It was an honor holding space. Honor holding space. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Buenas noches a todos. Nos vemos muy pronto. We'll see you soon on En Casa con la Plaza. Buenas noches. <laughs> thank you all. Bye, dog. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Woo!